Thomas and Friends season 14 first premiered in November 2010 in the UK and January 2011 in the US. There were 20 episodes in this series which were narrated by Michael Angelis in the UK and Michael Brandon in the US. It was directed by Greg Tiernan, produced by Nicole Stinn. The composer once again was Robert Hartshorn. I jumped into this season off the back of Misty Island Rescue. And honestly, it is a step up over that film. That being said, I'm not giving it very high standards to compare it to, because Misty Island was bad. We are now in the trenches of the Sharon Miller era, or the Nitrogen era, whichever one you want to call it. And honestly, I'm thinking this has some style, but no substance. By that I mean the stories are very generic, the CGI animation is what it's being known for at this point, and we just kind of have to ride it out. And that's essentially what I'm doing with this review. I'm riding this one out. I still did my analysis, which you're going to get. But where I used to feel the love of watching Thomas, that is gone as I get into these type of episodes. It makes me miss the classic era, and even at some points the hit era. You could tell at this point in the franchise's history that it was just an IP to make toys, rather than being a real true love for the job. And once again, because there's 20 episodes in this series, it's another ranking video. All 20 episodes, from worst to best, in my opinion. Your list will be different than mine, and that's the one thing that makes the Thomas fandom so unique. And let me know in the comments what your ranking list would be. All I ask is that you be respectful and above all, enjoy the video. Okay, let's dive in. Number 20, Pop Goes Thomas. Written by Mark Robertson, Thomas is amused by the popping sounds coming from his load of lemonade, but when he delivers the cargo, he discovers that the bottles are empty. I read in the notes in the Thomas Wiki that this was one of the last series to have Mark Robertson as a writer, and based on this episode, I can understand why. I want members of the fandom to do me a favour. I want you to find the Christopher Audrey story from the Railway series called Pop Special. I want you to reread that story in particular, and then watch this episode, because that story is like f Shakespeare compared to what we get with this. Everything about this episode is bad. All the worst traits of this era are on full display and smacking you in the face with the subtlety of a shovel. They even have Mr. Effin bubbles in it. All I could think after watching this episode was, I bet Sir Tom Hatt really regrets finding Thomas and going to Misty Island to get him. This is the splish splash splosh of season 14, and that it is absolutely awful. Number 19. Thomas and the Snowman Party. Written by Jessica Sandys Clark, Thomas must find a special hat for a snowman before the party can begin. Another episode where Mr. Bubbles is in it. Just shoot me. It's another episode where Thomas neglects his duties to help some kids. In season 13, it was a kite, and in this season, it's a hat for a snowman. Again, Thomas steals, and I emphasize, steals three different hats because he thinks he's doing the right thing for these kids. Yeah, the right thing is teaching kids that stealing is okay. This episode was predictable and extremely boring. Number 18, Pingy Pongy Pickup. Written by Miranda Larson, Emily must pick up the Sodor United football team's kits, but neglects her job and decides to help the other engines. Another final season for a writer, in this case Miranda Larson, and another episode where I can understand why, because this is bad. There are people in the fandom that like this episode, I honestly don't know why. First of all, the Fat Controller gives Thomas the assignment of delegating the jobs that need done, yet all the male engines decided amongst themselves what they were going to do, and gave Emily, the only girl, the job of picking up washing. What an extremely sexist stereotype! Like with all episodes of this era, rhyming speech, alliteration, especially in the title of the episode, the three strikes formula, and the characters act extremely childish. Yep, this is the start of the 2010s. This episode actually made me miss hit era bitch Emily, because she was extra annoying in this. It's like they looked at the hit era and went, okay, we need to make her extremely nice now, to the point where it's going to cut through you like a cheese grater. I guess this is a be careful what you wish for kind of scenario, because she was just so overpowering in this. Not a good episode. Number 17, Diesel's Special Delivery. Written by Jessica Sandys Clark, 
Diesel swaps his dull wood of slate for a hall of shiny red apples and bright flowers in order to please Sodor's school children. You can tell that this is a new writer because Jessica Sandys Clark does not understand this character of Diesel one iota. Diesel is a good guy in this. I don't understand why they all of a sudden made him do good or likeable character. He was the antithesis of evil, the OG villain on the island of Sodor. And now he wants to get the approval of some school children? What freaking bizarro world dimension did I wake up in? And James being straight up racist to Diesel at the start of the episode, again, emphasises that James is a ball bag. This must be how everyone else felt when they first watched Edward Strikes Out, because as with Edward changing his personality to this negative racist douche in season 10, Diesel is the reverse and he is the generic nice guy character who has absolutely no layers to him whatsoever. The story itself I think would have been okay, but it's just the wrong character in the role. I love to see Diesel in a main role, but not like this. Number 16, Merry Misty Island, written by Sharon Miller. Bash Dash and Ferdinand appear for the first ever Misty Island Christmas party. Here they are, a logging locos. I will admit that the premise of the story is quite interesting. These engines have been on an island all their lives and don't know anything about things like Christmas or the holidays. So having them looking at it from an outsider's perspective is how young children would look at Christmas as they're growing up and starting to experience the wonders and the joys of it. But sadly, as usual, the difference between premise and execution is staggeringly vast. This isn't how you want a holiday episode to go. It's not good, and actually a little annoying. Number 15, Thomas in Charge. Written by Mark Dady, the railway inspector pays a visit to Sodor, but Thomas's ambitious plans to impress him lead to chaos. I think there's a difference between ambitious and idiotic, because this is an idiotic plan. The whole premise of the episode is another crossed wires idea, where Thomas thinks that once again he makes good decisions and knows it all when he's actually a dumbass. I understand we're 14 seasons in. I understand this is an era that is not very much beloved by the fandom, but it's just so generic. The crash of the trucks was good even though it was predictable, but why I like the crash in particular? was the incidental music by Robert Hartshorn during it. That was really, really strong. I thoroughly enjoyed that music. That's all it had going for it. Number 14, Henry's Magic Box. Written by Shannon Miller, Henry helps the Fat Controller prepare a secret Christmas surprise. This is the really immature part of me, but anytime it was saying about, you know, guarding a box, I would just have a very immature giggle. If you know my sense of humor, you'll understand why. This episode has a winter setting, but it doesn't have that same pop that the winter episode in the previous season had. Again, there were so many innuendos about Henry looking after this special box, my head almost exploded. I think this episode is where the scaredy Henry made his debut, and for some reason, they thought this would be a great idea going forward. It wasn't. Like the setting itself, the story was bland and it just didn't quite, ironically, pop. Something I'm noticing about this series is that everything needs done by tea time. Why does everything need done by tea time? Does the entire island shut down at 5 o'clock? And also, how could you fit so many Christmas trees into that box? Even flat pack, there is no way you could have crushed all them in. Again, it just lacked that sparkle and magic that a Christmas or holiday season episode should have. Number 13, Thomas's Tall Friend. Written by Sharon Miller, Thomas must deliver a giraffe to the new animal park, but it's too excited to wait for its keeper story about trying to get a giraffe to sit. That's it. That's what this episode is about. Yes, we get a new location introduced in the animal park. And this giraffe arrives on Sodor, but none of the engines have ever seen a giraffe before. This really solidifies that this must be a new timeline because I'm pretty sure the circus came to town in season four in the classic era and there would have been a giraffe then. Also, something that's bugging me now. Thomas blushes when the Fat Controller tells him that the Animal Park opening is a disaster, but blushing is caused by a rush of blood. So that clearly means that the engines have blood. That's now going to give me nightmares for the foreseeable future, knowing that the engines can bleed. Number 12, Merry Winter Wish. Written by Miranda Larson, Thomas delivers the Star of Natford, a festive light that makes Christmas wishes come true. My Merry Winter Wish was that I didn't have to sit through this episode. I guess wishes don't come true. There's something that I seem to notice in a few of these episodes in season 14. 
is that they always start with Stanley and Rosie making some sort of cameo appearance where they don't say anything. It's like they're going, we still have these characters, but we don't want to use them in a story. I would much rather you use them in a story than just seeing them as a cameo. And everybody knows my love of cameos. Salty's in this episode, and he actually speaks. And I never got a chance to say this in my Misty Island Rescue review, but I love the voiceover work used for Salty. It suits him to a T. Why do they keep giving Thomas specials even though, at this point, even in the new timeline, he has an appalling track record of looking after specials? Honestly, when will they learn? Of course the star was going to fly off the flatbed. How many times has that happened since at least season 8? in this franchise. It's nothing special and pretty straightforward for this either. Number 11. Henry's Health and Safety Written by Shannon Miller, Henry becomes so concerned about safety, he interferes with Percy's jobs. Having Hero, Victor and Kevin in the first couple of minutes of this episode instantly elevated it for me, but that was about as high as it got. A lot of people like this episode and I'm not sure why. Henry not knowing about health and safety? He has been one of the most accident prone engines since season 1. Surely he would know about health and safety. I also don't like this one because I think this is where the hypochondriac Henry came into play. Just like the other Henry episodes set up him being a warrior. Two personality traits that the fandom absolutely hated for Henry going forward in the CGI seasons. Yet somehow the fandom think this is one of the best Henry episodes this season. It's not overly bad, I mean it's fine, but it's repetitive and it just got bogged down. And at least it was the first time seeing the Sodor Search and Rescue Centre since Misty Island Rescue. Speaking of which, where the heck is Captain? You introduce him in a movie and then you don't bring him up again. Number 10, Thomas's Crazy Day. Written by Sharon Miller, the fat controller enlists Thomas to teach the logging locals how to be useful, but he has already promised to play a game with Percy. Couldn't help but laugh at Cranky just getting more and more ticked off with Thomas just dumping the logging locals on him to run away and play with Percy. He spent a full movie with those logging locals, so I'd be running like as well. And when Cranky had Ferdinand loaded up and was going to put him on a ship, quite frankly I would have just dropped him in the sea. Ironically, it's Cranky that made this episode for me. I have never related to a character so much than I had in this episode. Again, the rhyming speech was annoying, but at least Ferdinand said more than two words in this episode. That was okay, I guess. Number 9. Jumping Joby Wood. Written by Shannon Miller, Thomas is ordered to collect some precious Joby Wood from Misty Island, but chaos ensues when old Wheezy starts throwing the logs around. It was a nice opening shot of the Sodor Search and Rescue Center. You can definitely see the playset potential by how it looks. Why does the Fat Controller not like being called Boss? Ferdinand calls him Boss and he looks at Ferdinand like a mother would look at someone that came in and their Christmas dinner. It was so random, I didn't get that. I understand why Edward thinks Misty Island is strange, but it's not like he didn't go over to Misty Island to try and find Thomas in the previous movie, so he does have some idea of what it's about. Also, the use of crazy in this episode for someone that has mental health issues like myself can see it as a bit offensive in today's society, but I know the context of it, so I wasn't offended. The episode was fine and Edward had a semi-prominent role in it, so I can't really complain too much. Number 8. Thomas and Scruff Written by Sharon Miller, Thomas tries to clean a new engine named Scruff, but as soon as he knows he's getting a wash, he runs off in terror. Oh, this reminds me of my kids at shower time. Once again, Cliff is back. I'm still getting used to his voiceover work in this era. I honestly think his voice should be a little bit younger, but you get used to it. We also have a new engine introduced in Scruff, who is there, I guess. But why is it Thomas that always has to meet the new engines? And why does he think that because Scruff is dirty that he won't be useful? He's just came back from the dump where he has seen Whiff, who is dirty and smelly, but also really useful. The entire premise of this episode, you guessed it, is redundant. Oh, and Henry still needs special coal, so yeah, there's that. Another bog standard episode that's made bearable by the introduction of a new character, and of course, Whiff. Number 7. Toby and the Whistling Woods Written by Louise Kramskoy, Thomas and James help Toby get through the Whistling Woods. I'm trying now to get past the fact that Toby is not the character that he was in the classic era and the Railway series. This is who we have now and I'm trying to see the character for who he is now rather than what he was previously. And the premise of the story is quite interesting and makes for a relatively good episode. 
It's an episode about Toby being scared, but not wanting to admit that he's scared because he has it drummed into him that old engines aren't meant to be scared. And I can kind of understand that. Everybody does get scared, no matter how old you are. But there's a stereotype that the older you get, the less things are meant to terrify you. And I'm going to go a little bit dark here, so please bear with me. The older you get, the closer you're getting to death. And death is the most terrifying thing in existence. So getting old doesn't mean that you have fear. It's what you do in spite of it that makes you brave. That's where I think the premise and the execution of this episode kind of differs. There were flashes of what the episode could have been, but once again, the three strikes formula kind of drag it down for me. And having the message rammed down your throat is just of its time right now. But I will say that the animation of the Whistling Woods, especially the scene with the waterfall, was absolutely beautiful. Number six, Oh the Indignity. Written by Shannon Miller, Gordon is put in charge of Whip's Waste Dump one clean Sodor day. Why is the title called O oh, the Indignity with just an O rather than an O-H and a comma? That's just bad grammar. I know it's a small detail, but it's something that annoys me. It's another episode where Gordon is a pompous twat, but it does make for good comedy. And the engines that he's hiding from in this episode, such as Spencer, James and Diesel, make sense for his character because he wouldn't want those engines seeing him in that situation and in that setting. The episode was good, it showed Gordon out of his comfort zone, and I did enjoy it. It's kind of like the Ron seal of Thomas and Friends episodes. It does exactly what it says in the tin. Number 5. Jitters and Japes Written by Sharon Miller, Thomas takes Dowager Hat on a slow tour of Misty Island, but Dowager wants to have a more exciting trip. The Fat Controller's mum wants to go to Misty Island, the most bonkers place in the whole of existence. What could possibly go wrong? Everything but not for the reasons that you expect. And that's why I like this episode. It totally subverted your expectations. Up to this point, Dowager Hat had no discernible personality. She was just generic mum. So when Thomas did the generic old person things, and we had the subvergence of that she wanted something exciting and a bit dangerous, I really liked that. It showed that there could be character development with Dowager Hat. She's a thrill seeker. She likes a bit of adventure and has a bit of bite about her. The writers finally realised they could do something with this character. Better late than never. Number 4. James in the Dark Written by Mark Robertson, James refuses to wear an old-fashioned headlamp at night and picks up Farmer McCall, Farmer Trotter and their animals instead of Alicia Botti. Alicia Botti is back again. How does she keep getting so many gigs? There's a beautiful opening shot of Sodor at sunset. It's always good seeing Victor at the Steamworks, and James not wanting to wear a lamp because it makes him look silly is very, well, James. I can understand James not seeing the engines in the dark, but there's two things that bother me with this. One, your eyes do adjust to the night as it goes on, so you should have been able to see them at some point. And two, he's worked with these engines for god knows how many decades by now. He should recognise their voices. It just doesn't make sense for me. That being said, I did enjoy the episode, and James is still in character, so I gotta give them something for that. Number 3. Being Percy Written by Rachel Dawson, Percy decides to imitate Gordon in order to get the other engines to take notice of him. I'm going to share a little bit of something about myself, because it relates to why this episode had an impact on me. I am really, really struggling with my confidence right now. It's at an all-time low. I really want to get back to the confident person that I was, but I'm struggling to find that. So I could really relate to Percy in this episode. I understand his motivation at wanting to be heard and wanting to feel important, but trying to imitate Gordon was the wrong way to go. It's kind of like how guys like me, when we are struggling with confidence, try and act overconfident to overcompensate but it just makes us look arrogant. This was the same situation that Percy was going through. It's a good episode, aside from the rhyming speech, but that little game of chicken that Percy and Gordon were playing was really good, and it led up to quite an exciting crash. So I have to say, this episode was rather enjoyable. Number 2. Charlie and Eddie Written by Shannon Miller, Edward tries to show Charlie that he is a fun engine, instead of delivering the Fat Controller's car to a mechanic. I did not expect to like this episode as much as I did for two reasons. This is where Charlie starts becoming the joke machine, and it is incredibly annoying. He was a real jerk calling Edward old. 
But this is where the episode turned for me because Edward took the bait. He started trying to be fun, telling jokes, taking some risks and being a bit reckless. I can understand why people will think this is out of character for Edward, but again, I was peeling back the layers of the subtext of the episode. This reminds me of a granddad that is trying to impress his grandkids. He starts doing silly things and stupid things to try and seem cool and fun when really it is going to get him into trouble. But when it all comes crashing down on them, Edward has to go back to being himself and tell Charlie that it's not the time for jokes and it's not the time for fun. It's time to act responsible and it's time to do the jobs that you're meant to do. And that is what makes Edward cool in the first place. Being himself is what makes him the engine that we all love. It's a good message about being true to yourself. And as I said previously, I've been struggling with my confidence lately. So I really needed this. And the number one episode of Thomas and Friends season 14 is Victor Says Yes. Written by Denise Kasser. Victor bites off more than he can chew when he agrees to fix many of Sodor's engines on the same day. A Victor-centric episode, some character development on a new engine, and the story was good. It's these little gems of episodes that make me so frustrated with this era, because there are good ones there. We just don't get enough of them. The only thing that ticked me off was Ari and Bert were at the Steamworks to get repaired. But in the next movie, you find out that there is a diesel works for diesels to be repaired. So why are they at the Steamworks in the first place? Even if they were there first, it still doesn't make sense. They have their own place to get repaired. Am I the only one that thinks it doesn't make sense? I do know this is going to go into the, the diesels, but just, just go with me right now. I think we were all just so hyped by the fact we actually saw Ari and Bert in the CGI that we kind of forgot that the point of them being there didn't make sense. But aside from that, it's a really good episode. It gives you an insight into Victor's character. He's helpful, he's a bit too accommodating, he's scared to say no, and tends to bite off more than he can chew. Again, I relate to this, because you're so busy trying to please everyone that you don't know your limitations, and it comes back and bites you in the backside. And that is exactly what happened to Victor. Victor's got so many jobs to do, and not enough help to do it, because quite frankly, Kevin is about as useful as a chocolate teapot. You feel bad for Victor because you know he needs help. It's not his fault that all these engines have the problems that they have. And the Fat Controller is such a massive bell end. He's the one who should be able to see that Victor is struggling and go, okay, don't take so much on. No, he just piles more pressure on him. What a dick. But overall, this is a really solid episode and the best of season 14 by far. And that's my ranking video on Thomas and Friends Season 14. What did you think of this season? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, keep on chugging!